So we're in the last chapter of Philippians, as you know, chapter 4, taking our time with some of these particularly familiar verses. We've been to many of these verses at other times in other contexts. This is the first time we're going to them in their context as we work through the verses. Uh, Tonight we're going to look at two verses, verses 6 and 7. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. These are particularly well-known verses, particularly important and helpful for us. Paul's giving us important ways to be handling and dealing with life as we're waiting on the Lord. Um, More is connected to these verses that follow, but I'd like to hone in on these two tonight. But recognize uh, they continue on in the the verses that come with what we're very familiar with about having God's peace, having contentment, no matter what's happening to us, good or bad, and um, also uh, being able to do all things through Christ. And of course, more things continue. Uh, We've looked at his call for us to rejoice always in the Lord. We've looked at his call to uh, be moderate in how we work with one another, deferential to others uh, in the Lord. And tonight, uh, because because the Lord is near, and tonight um, we're going to continue to look at things Paul is telling us to do to be able to handle life, and in particular, how to handle anxiety, how to deal with worry. And I would remind you as I'm about to read these verses, this is not a suggestion. (laughs) This is a command. But as I've often said for my own life and as I've spoken with others, what a merciful command. What a merciful command we have tonight not to worry. Sometimes the only reason I'm able to do it is simply because Christ commands. I can just let it be at that and it never disappoints But we're going to learn how we deal with worry with the antidote, which is prayer. Hear now the word of the Lord, Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let me read that once more. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Gordon Clark quotes someone named Motier. Motier, Motier, I assume it's a French name. <laughs> he quotes somebody about this verse, and I, I think it's really a, a really lovely thing to consider as we begin thinking of these verses tonight. This verse is, quote, a promise that our lives will be touched with the evidence of the supernatural. If we give ourselves to these verses in practice, our lives will be touched with the supernatural. You want to have your lives touched with the supernatural? You won't with worry. You will with prayer, which takes us to God. Christians must not be anxious over anything but instead pray to God about everything and always enjoy his supernatural, peaceful presence. I give that, to you, uh, give that to you as the main idea of our text this evening. Christians must not be anxious over anything, but instead pray to God about everything and always enjoy his supernatural, peaceful presence. Thomas Watson wrote this, It is our work to cast care, and it is God's work to take care. Simply put, don't worry. Be praying. That's the message for you this evening. Don't worry. Be praying. And I confess, if you might be hearing in there, the song I grew up with in the 80s by Bobby McPherson, I think it is, uh, uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Yeah, that's in there a little bit. I was going to try to make it a little more 
profound, but I thought, no, I want to give you something you'll remember, <laughs> and I'll remember. Don't worry. Be praying. By the way, by the way <laughs> just for a, a side note, uh, when I was driving earlier this week with Abraham and we were bringing a cake home mommy had ordered, and she's very particular about her cakes and make sure it doesn't get hit on the, on the box, you know, along the way. And um, we kind of hit a bump in the road, and I said, oh, no. <laughs> Tell me the cake didn't hit the side. And if it did, I hope it's not the part that says, happy birthday, Gabriel, because <laughs> you know, it was on the side. I said, oh, man, if it is, I'm dead beat. And Abraham says, well, it was nice knowing you. What song do you want played at your funeral? And... <laughs> And, and thankfully, thankfully, everything was fine. It was fine. But I joked. I thought about it for a minute, and I said, don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> and we had a good laugh, but now I'm committed to it. So any of you who may be there, uh, deal with it and enjoy it. <laughs> so I guess that partly was why I thought of this. But I really think this is helpful for us. Don't worry. Be praying. How don't we worry? Be praying. It's a command not to worry, but how do we really pull that off? By praying, replacing the worry with prayer. Replacing the fear with faith, but actively praying. Beloved, don't be anxious for anything, ever. That's what Paul says tonight. It's quite quite a command, quite a statement. Don't be anxious for anything, ever. Ever. You know, when we keep worrying, it's like we lock ourselves in a prison cell of solitary confinement. Our thoughts bounce off the walls and back into our brains and ricochet as we can't go anywhere with them by walking in circles, wearing holes in the floor and in our heads. That's the problem. The beginning of verse 7 tonight. Be careful. But literally it means be anxious. Be worrisome. But of course, you got to remember what's tacked onto it. For nothing. (laughs) Be anxious for nothing. Worry about nothing. When we worry, we try and be God. As if we are in control. But we actually can do nothing about anything. We won't add to our life by worry. But we very likely will take away some time from our lives by worry. And we don't get any resolve of peace because we can't give it to ourselves. We can't give ourselves peace from ourselves. We're not all knowing. We don't know how this is all going to work out. We can't control just about anything, let alone we ought to work on controlling ourselves more, which is getting into the prayer part of it. But we can't give ourselves any peace by worrying. We just make it worse. Worrying makes it worse. Worrying often makes us act in ways that are foolish and bring more worry upon ourselves. And it becomes a lonely thought life. Because we can't possibly understand it all, let alone do anything about it. We create fear instead of nurture faith. And we have none of God's peace and no contentment. I want to remind you, if you'd like to hear more about this, I'm not giving you everything as I often, I know I tend to bring it all to you, but we've talked about these things a lot. I want to remind you of The lovely book, The Art of Divine Contentment by Thomas Watson, the Puritan Thomas Watson. And we studied that on Wednesday night years ago. And I said to you at the beginning, I've read the book. And the reason I want to study it with you is I need to read it again. (laughs) I need help to be content at this moment of difficulty. And we studied it together. We went into great detail. And it was based on this chapter. And in particular, starting with these verses. So I want to encourage you, if you want to go back and listen to it in great detail, maybe studying along with the book, you can go to our sermon audio page. We, you can look for the series. There's, you can click on series, and you can click on the series, Thomas Watson and the Art of Divine Contentment. So I'm not giving you a lot of what I want to, 
because uh, I don't want you to be worrying about being here all night. And I've given it to you often before, and I'm just going to touch on a few things and uh, not, not overlap so much with the same things. But I encourage you to remember to go to that if you like. Because Jesus says, and this is what we studied a lot in relation to it, Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 6. And by the way, I want to turn there with you tonight. We're going to go back and forth with Matthew 6 and Philippians 4. And I point out to you that when I, the sermon I preached on this text, I came back to Matthew, the series, after about six to eight months not being capable of doing it. And when I came back, it was a pretty profound text to have to come to, to return back to Matthew. It was exactly what I needed. And this is very much reflected in Paul. I believe, as most commentators do, Paul is really reflecting what Jesus has said in Matthew 6. But that sermon is the most listened to sermon by far on our sermon audio page on Matthew 6, which I'd like to turn with you now. Let's, let's turn there. Matthew 6, verse 25. Please keep Philippians marked. We will come back to it. Matthew 6, verses 25 to 31. And I'm not going to get into more of the context, just the main point that's applied no matter what. Beginning with verse, uh, excuse me, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, now this is Jesus, take no thought for your life. Now, that idea of take no thought is the same Greek behind the words be careful in our text tonight in Philippians. Take no thought or be careful is the same idea. Don't worry. Don't be anxious with worrisome thoughts. Take, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought, that is worrying, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought? Why do you worry for raiment, your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Something Christ says often to us, especially in such contexts, when we choose to worry, we are exercising little faith. And verse 31, therefore, take no thought. Notice that keeps coming up. Don't worry. Don't be be careful for things. Take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or with all shall we be clothed? Jesus says, don't worry about any of those things like the Gentiles do, we see. Don't be like the world. As children of God in Christ, don't be like the world. Don't be worrying about how everything's going to be provided for. Now, this doesn't mean we don't have to be responsible and we don't have to be concerned to do our best to provide. But at the end of the day, we need to say, I'm going to trust God for my daily bread. What's in the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. And we say, you know, I had bread yesterday. In fact, I had a lot more than bread, which is why I need to get to the why. And Paul says, if you have clothes and you have um, food, don't worry. Be content. Right? So much of not worrying relates to being able to be content. And is it not being content and being anxious why so many are looking to find that in other ways? That can't give it. But they pay a lot of money for it year after year after year. It's free from Christ. Contentment and peace. As we would choose not to worry. Again, I preached on this text. It was the most listened to sermon by far. And the name of the sermon was this, keep changing the way you think. We're going to see that relates. It's, all, it's so much about how you're thinking and what you do with your thinking and need to turn it to prayer. But I want to point out that Paul in the weeks to come is going to talk about thinking, what we should think about and what we shouldn't spend time thinking about. And that's how we have more peace, controlling our thinking. And can I say, really, controlling our emotions by our thinking rather than the other way around. 
And Jesus keeps saying, think not, give no thought. But again, the Greek word is the same in our text of Philippians 4. Let's turn back there now. That says, be careful for nothing. Same Greek word. In both cases, Jesus and Paul is saying literally in the Greek, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. That's the command. And again, in both of these texts, what a merciful command, isn't it? To sometimes be able to say, you know, I'm I'm just going to lay down and go to sleep, and I'm not going to worry about that anymore. Not because it feels natural, not because I'm seeing any change, simply because God commands me not to worry. And when I choose just to trust him and I'm not going to worry about it, all of a sudden, the night goes a lot better. The sleep goes a lot better. The next morning begins a lot better. What a merciful command to not be anxious for anything. Notice he rules out anything. Oh yeah, but of course, this I can worry about, right, Lord? No! (laughs) Well, but I could worry about this. No! Nothing. Nothing. Nada. Nothing. I I, I kind of emphasize that because I think you and I We tend to think, well, did God really mean, and we let Satan influence about this, but this is such a significant issue. Surely you have to be worrying about this. If you're not worrying, then you don't care, right? No, I'm told to take care, to be careful for nothing, because I can trust that God cares. You see, be always praying about everything. That's the antidote to anxiety. That's the antidote. That's the medicine for anxiety. Prayer in Jesus Christ. Now, it can only be for Christians. But isn't that a wonderful gospel witness? There's a whole lot of people out there buying false stuff to try to pretend it's going to help. And you say, look, I got something for free here. I have Jesus Christ, the grace of God. You come to Jesus for free, and then you can pray to him through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You can talk with God and have his supernatural presence and peace. Nothing is ever going to come close to that. Nothing ever could. What a gospel witness you have there. The antidote to anxiety. Prayer in the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Lord Jesus Christ, as our text says tonight. Bringing us straight to God. And therefore giving us God's peace to take with us. I know everyone wants to argue against that, but it's that simple. It's supernatural, but it's that simple. It's that great. And the reason we don't embrace it enough is unbelief and worldly influence. And we deny ourselves God and his supernatural presence of peace. Don't be anxious for anything ever, Paul says. Instead, Paul says, be thankfully praying to God always. And I think all of us need to be challenged when we're expressing all of our anxiety and worries. Have you been praying to God about it? And the answer most assuredly is going to be no. Or not enough because we're told to pray without ceasing. Don't be anxious for anything ever. Instead, be thankfully praying to God always. Rachel showed us a a cross-stitching thing she's making, and it's really beautiful. And uh, it's got all these lovely flowers, and she's been working on it for a while. It's just just lovely. But she happened to turn it over, and I said, oh, I remember we've thought about this before. The mess on the back, all the threads all over the place, right? That's not the part you hang facing out from the wall, right? Nobody wants to go and say... They wouldn't say beautiful. They say, hmm, interesting. <laughs> you know, like, because it's not something we can really comprehend. And we can't comprehend how it does what happens when you look on the front side. The beautiful picture, the beautiful work of art, the beautiful thing. And she's following instructions by design that creates that beautiful flower. Those beautiful flowers, that lovely thing to look upon. We enjoy that. The backside has all these strings all over the place that are hard to make sense of. We don't need to worry about it, though, because we could just look at the front. That's the point. That's, that's all we got to be thinking about. We can let Rachel worry about how she put it all together. In fact, uh, Mommy and I looked at it and were like, oh, I don't know how you do that. I couldn't do that. I don't have patience. But I, boy, that's pretty. What a marvelous job, right? 
And I don't have to worry about how she did it. I can just enjoy it. I can enjoy sharing it with one another. See, God's providence is all that stuff on the other side that looks like a mess, but it's all being weaved together. So on the front, you see that beautiful picture. And you don't need to understand how they put it all together, unless you really want to try. But with God, you can't. You just have to trust he's making a beautiful picture. It's beyond our ability to understand how it all works on the other side, behind the scenes. We need to remember to recognize there's a beautiful thing God is doing on the other side of what we can't see, but trust that we will in his timing and ultimately in the end, so far as we human beings are able to. But the problem is anxiety. Just focusing on the other side and I don't get how this all works. It's never gonna, it's never gonna work. And then we just need to have people turn it over. Look, oh. And how do we do that? The solution is praying. The problem is anxiety. The solution is praying. Verse seven. And by the way, you don't find that in a bottle. And you don't find it with a psychologist. In fact, they'll encourage you not to think of any of those things. But you do find it in God and Christ. And it is supernatural. It'll change your life like nothing else can. Look at the second part of verse 7. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Oh, excuse me. I meant to say verse uh, 6. Verse 6, the second part. Excuse me, that's a typo on my notes. Uh, Notice this in verse 6, the second part. The first part is be careful for nothing. Don't worry. Okay, well, what am I supposed to do with all this stuff? Bring it to God in prayer. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You see that? It's that simple. We could stop right there. That's really what we need to know from the scriptures. Don't worry. Well, how do I do that? Get rid of the old man, but you put in the new. Pray with thanksgiving. Talk about it with God. Bring your concerns to God. That is the antidote to anxiety. Oh, we need to go to him regularly without ceasing. Sometimes we need to keep going to God quite a bit just to say, please help me stop worrying. Please take away the anxiety that I'm causing myself. And that right there is a glorious answer to prayer. Prayer is talking with God, the living God through Christ. Again, it can only be done through Christ. It says our hearts and minds through Christ. If we are not Christians, if we don't know God savingly through the blood of the Lamb, if we haven't trusted in Jesus to pay for our sins on the cross and his perfect righteousness to be our eternal life, then we don't have a way to pray to God. But we need Christ. All of you, may you have Christ tonight. And then in Christ, through Christ, you can come to God and have prayer. You can have that peace with God that's said elsewhere. If we are in Christ, we have peace with God. We have reconciliation with God. We can go call on God as our what? Our Father. As his children. And as we just studied recently in uh, the shorter catechism, adoption. What is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. We have a right to come to God and expect he'll listen to us because he's made us his children. He is our father through Jesus Christ. We can call on him and have fellowship. You see, it's like when you want to call somebody on the phone. Best One of the good things you can do, you call someone, can I talk? I'm feeling down. I'm feeling nervous. Can I talk? And a lot of times I feel better. Thanks for talking. Especially if it's a believer, a brother or sister draws us to God in Christ. Let's pray. But especially we, because if we go to God and we have fellowship with him and we have that supernatural but real true presence with God in prayer, that's what prayer does for us. We can't help but go away changed by that. We can't help but go away feeling different, thinking differently. Having fellowship, taking time with God and talking with God and hearing God. Now, especially recalling his word, what I find is when prayer really starts to make a difference, God starts to bring his word to my mind. So you've got to be reading your Bible, and he works with that. He puts it in you, and he draws it out of you. 
Uh, when we studied prayer on Wednesday nights many years ago, I recall a story, I don't remember who shared it or who it was about, but a particular minister used to get up hours early in the morning to pray because it took him so long to feel like he was really praying. And he found when he started to start his prayer first with the word of God and talk from the word of God, that God filled those prayers with his word. And that's what God will do. He'll bring scriptures to mind to give you that peace. Things you won't think of in worry. He'll bring those things to mind. He'll help you recall his word and he'll speak to you by the spirit through it. And he'll fill you. And he wants you to be filled with thanks when you pray. That's the other thing, one of the aspects of prayer. We see some of the acronym ACTS, right? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. We see the idea of requests, supplications. We see thanksgiving. It needs to be filled with thanksgiving. Remember 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says explicitly, God's will for you is to be thankful. And so as we come to the Lord and we remember to be thankful for all he's done for us, as we begin with, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being my God. Thank you for not leaving me to myself in my filthy leprosy of sin. Thank you for touching me and saving me, Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins right there. How can you not be thankful the rest of the way in your prayers? You come to the Lord in prayer with thanksgiving and you won't be complaining and murmuring against him in worry. Because what is worry but to complain? That's what we see in numbers, right? They're so often murmuring and complaining and ending up dying about it because they just wouldn't trust God and weren't thankful for what he had already done for them. Come to the Lord with thanksgiving in your prayers. Offer up supplications with thanksgiving. Make requests. Ask things of God, but with thanksgiving. Dennis Johnson says this, Grumbling is replaced with gratitude. And he writes, gratitude preserves our prayers from going sour with complaint or degenerating into a list of self-centered demands. Thankfulness causes us to come to the Lord with appropriate prayers and even to be praying for others. J. Montgomery Boyce reminds us that prayer should also be corporate at times. We should be praying together. We should come together and pray when we have concerns on our hearts. And prayer is to often be intercession, praying on behalf of one another, knowing what they're going through, that the Lord would give them peace, bring them to prayer, meet their needs. Some pretty powerful examples of how God uses our prayers for others. One example Jim Montgomery Boyce does share is there was a man, I think he had like 40 years serving in Nigeria as a missionary, and there was one time he was running late to get to a meeting And he had to cross a big field. And you were not to cross the big field. That was one of the understood rules because you'd be in great danger of being run over by large African animals. And so you had to go on the on the sides and the outskirts. But he was so late he decided to run through. And what he started to hear was a bunch of rhinoceros charging after him. And he got on his knees and he simply prayed, Lord, I'm near, I'm coming. Something like that, like I'm expected to die. And then he looked up, footprints all around him, not a rhino touched him. He learned years later that somebody across the world was praying for his missionary work. And he learned it was that exact time the man woke up from sleep and felt a burning uh, call on himself to pray for this missionary halfway around the world. And it was the exact same moment that he was saved from that charge of rhinoceros. He went on to the meeting. We need to be praying for others, beloved. We need to say, Lord, put on my heart who I should be praying. And as you and I are praying for the concerns of others, we won't nearly have concerns and take worry on ourselves so much. We'll be too busy, concerned for the needs of others, and that God would intercede for them. Beloved, make your prayers known to God. Don't just keep your concerns in. Talk about it with God. The result is verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Oh, no, excuse me. The result is verse 7. I've been getting ahead of myself in my notes here. Uh, The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the problem is worry and anxiety. The solution or antidote is praying to God about everything. And then the blessing, the result of it is having The peace of God that passeth all understanding and keeps your hearts 
through Christ Jesus. It is a means of grace, remember. We talk about this in our Westminster Standards. Prayer is a means of grace. God works gracious blessings in your life as you come to him in prayer through Christ. Notice it will guard your heart. It'll block your heart from worry and anxiety that wants to get in there by the suggestions of Satan. That's a way to guard your heart from worry is to bathe it in prayer before the Lord. It'll keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, who has given you peace with God through his sacrifice and resurrection. Notice the earlier refrain when Paul's been telling us to do a lot of things together, he keeps saying, In the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, right? Do this or that. Stand fast together against bad influences in the Lord. And last, we were told, uh, show moderation to everyone because the Lord is near. Christ is near. He's present. He's at hand. Work with him in prayer. Draw near to him. He will draw even nearer. James says, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. He's already near. Draw near to him. He'll draw near Fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He who has been singing in the Gospel of Mark in our evening readings has the power and authority of God in his preaching, has the power of God to heal and deliver from demons. Who could you spend your time with better than that? What would have a greater influence on your life? Guard against anxiety attacks with prayer. Prayer to God in Christ Jesus. Now, this peace of God, what is it? What is it? Is it just inner serenity? You know, kind of a, um, I don't know. (laughs) Is it just peace? No. It's fellowship with God. And that provides serenity, but it's fellowship with God. It's a supernatural experience of time with the Most High God. This is what's really exciting, beloved. You have to remember this. When you spend time praying to God, it's a supernatural encounter. It's a close encounter of the supernatural kind. It's a life-changing experience. You don't walk away the same. If you're really giving yourself to the Lord in prayer... It exceeds all comprehension. That's the idea of it surpasses understanding. You don't come away knowing much more about your problems, but you come away always reminded that God knows all, that nothing is impossible for him, and that he is working all things for your good and his glory. You can't comprehend all of the mess behind the pretty flowers Forget it. It's impossible. You're not God. You're not infinite. You're not eternal in your understanding. You're not omnipresent. You're not omniscient. You can't possibly. It's not possible for all of God's knowledge for you to have it. But you can know God who has it. And that peace of God, that shalom within himself, because he's got it all under control. He knows exactly what's happening. It's all under his sovereign plan and providence. You spend time with him and he reminds you of such things that you know from the word and the means of grace you give yourselves to regularly in worship and in prayer and in study. And you have his peace. God is shalom in himself. And taking our cares to him gives us him who is shalom. You walk away with more of a sense of the presence of God with you wherever you are. Because he is. But you forget. And in prayer he reminds you, I'm right here. I'm right here. I've got you. I've got this. You don't need to worry. But when we don't pray, we forget and we worry. and We think we're alone and abandoned. Which is exactly what Satan wants you to do. A prayerful perspective is what you will be given, which we forget with worrying alone. Prayer is giving yourself over to trusting in and talking with God, though you won't walk away with a lot of specific knowledge because it's too much for you. It's beyond all your comprehension. But it's not over God's head who is incomprehensible. 
He's, behind, be, he's beyond finding out. Romans eleven thirty three to 36. You can't, you can't know his mind. You can't know how he's doing everything. You can't understand all the things he's weaving in and out and why sometimes it hurts. But you can know that he's doing all things for your good and to his glory. And so what does... You know, that, that's what Paul's talking about at the beginning of the letter, right? I'm suffering in prison. I'm chained to a Roman soldier, and I rejoice because God's using it to advance the gospel, and that's what we're all here for. He's saying to the Philippian church, I rejoice. I call you to rejoice, whatever you're going through, whatever you're suffering with, with me in the ministry, because God's using it to advance the gospel. Praise the Lord. Let it be known unto God. Now, it's not that God doesn't know these things, right? In Matthew 6.32, Jesus says, Your heavenly Father already knows what you need. But pray, he says. Why? Because it's really more for you. God, God is the same yesterday, today, today, and forever. It's about you. It's about you being closer to God and having the peace of God in Christ. Let your requests be made known unto God. They talk about them. Speak about them with God. When you go to God, you are reminded to remember his providence and his presence and his purpose. He makes himself known to you in prayer. And don't we say when we've gotten together with a good friend, boy, we need to get together more regularly. It's just so good to talk with you again. It's so good to remember things together. It's so good to spend time together. I miss it. He makes himself known to you. He soothes your spirit in the spirit of Christ in prayer. Gordon Clark points out that this idea of surpassing understanding, passing understanding, it's something like transcending every human thought. You, you just go on, I don't know, I don't get it, but I know my God, and he does. I can peace with that. It's trusting him when you don't know. It's faith instead of fear of the unknown. It's like we tell our kids just to trust us often, right? Because they can't understand it at their age, but we got them covered. We have the situation covered. And they can go play. And they can go to sleep with that time of reassurance in the presence of their wiser parents. Moises Silva explains, God's peace transcends our intellectual powers precisely because believers experience it when it is unexpected in circumstances that make it appear impossible. Paul suffering in prison, the Philippians threatened by quarrels within and by enemies without, and yet they can have peace. And people can witness that peace, and nobody can explain it except it's Jesus in my life. It's God talking to God in prayer through Jesus. It's knowing where this is all leading and that God's weaving something I can't understand at all. I'm never going to be able to understand it all, but I can just trust God does, and it's going to be fine. And it is fine. Frank Thielman says that the use of this Greek word for be anxious Elsewhere in other scriptures, and when you look at the context of Philippians, it suggests that it is most likely in view how to handle persecution for serving Christ. And if you think about a lot of what Paul's talked about, especially in chapter 1, some issues at the beginning and close of chapter 3, particularly he's saying when you're persecuted for Jesus, remember Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted for me. And everybody says bad things about you for my name's sake. Blessed are you, so are the prophets. He says, when you're persecuted for the gospel, when you're persecuted for speaking the truth in a world of lies and everybody just wants you to lie to them. Because the proverb says that's what, that's what flatterers do to get something out of you. Very few are real true friends who will speak the truth, the wounds of a friend as Proverbs speaks about. And so we're told... We're going to suffer. We're going to struggle. But lastly, we saw recently, and rejoice, 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 rejoice. How can you do that? Supernatural promise of God. How can you not worry and instead have peace from God? Because it's God's peace. It's God's shalom. He has perfect peace because he knows exactly what he's doing. And we can't have him explain it all to us. But we have his peace. We have trust knowing in him. including when you're being persecuted. And you're like, I don't get it. Why do they hate me for telling them the truth? Why do they hate Jesus? Why do they hate the truth of the gospel? They'll be set free by the truth of God's word and all these things. Why instead do they persecute us and say all these bad things about us? 
We can have peace because we can remember what God tells us about all these things, including earlier in this, chap- in, this, in this letter. Beloved, you can have a peace that is unexplainable, humanly speaking, but you can credit God who sends you away joyful and peaceful in spite of, and even sometimes because of, your difficult circumstances. The world says, that doesn't make any sense. How can you be happy? How can you be thankful right now? You can say, oh, I can't make sense of it either. But God transcends. God reassures me in prayer that he is making perfect sense of it all and he knows best. And I can rest in that. No other answer is promised, by the way. Have you noticed in the scripture? He doesn't say, bring your request to God and he'll give you exactly what you're asking for in the particular details. There's no promise for that. We don't know. Sometimes we find out later and we say, thank you, God, not answering that prayer request because that wouldn't have been best for me. At the time, I was sure it was. You know, sometimes his answer is no, and we thank God later in his, as we see a little bit of the tapestry behind the scenes and the flower that comes out over here that we would have missed on the front side. No other answer is promised but God's supernatural, all-transcending, human-understanding peace. But isn't that really what we need the most? And of course, what we'll have perfectly in heaven, in the new heavens and the new earth, where there'll be no more tears and no more death and no more wars, no more darkness. It's what we need most now. And again, what a witness to the world to be able to say, I have no idea what's happening with my life. I gave up trying to figure that out a long time ago. Don't get me wrong, I make my plans, but God directs my steps. And a lot of times it had no way direction I was going. (laughs) But I can see later a lot of times, I'm glad he turned me around over there. But you know, I've just learned to trust God, who's in charge of it all. And I have peace, surpassing my ability to understand the details. That's what we're talking about here. Remember, Jesus prayed, not my will, but thine be done. And walked away with peace towards his crucifixion. So you can have peace in God without full understanding other than in God, in Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus, just as earlier in the Lord, the Lord is near. You can have his peace. He has a call on your life and a purpose in your suffering. He has a purpose in your persecution. I want to ask you to turn back with me to Matthew chapter 6, this similar text where we're told by Jesus more directly from his own mouth on earth not to worry, to take no thought, to be careful for nothing. Matthew chapter 6, I want to pick up where we left off. He says, don't worry about all these things. And then looking at verse 32 of Matthew chapter 6. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. That means essentially the idea of those who aren't God's covenant people in Christ. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That is the most important thing. Put God first. Seek his kingdom first. Everything else will be taken care of. That's what we're here for, advancing his kingdom. Prayer helps you do that. It helps you put your priorities in the proper place according to God's kingdom call upon your life. Most of the time, I, I venture to guess that you and I are worrying about things that are not about his kingdom being first and foremost, but about our kingdoms being first and foremost, including I'm not concerned about being content with difficult times. I want comfort. I want it now. That's all I want. That's not seeking his kingdom first. We won't get everything else if we keep putting our kingdom first. Prayer is to put him first. It starts with our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And then I start asking him for things. And then it closes. How does it close? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's the prayer wrapped up with some requests and thanksgiving in between, which is appropriate. We bring all these things before the Lord, but in the context of him and his kingdom, putting his things first. Verse 34. 
Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Notice, it's evil. The days are evil. Redeem the time for the days are evil, the scriptures say. Yes, the scripture is acknowledging life is hard. Because of sin, we are in a fallen world, and the wages of sin is death. The hope of the Christian is the resurrection through the Lord Jesus Christ, who's paid for our sins on the cross, given us his righteousness, so we have everlasting life, and we're spared from hell that is coming for all who will not bow the knee to Christ and confess him as their Lord. We have this free grace in God in Christ, and he says, don't worry about tomorrow. How many times do we worry about something tomorrow and it never happens? We get all these things in our head. We worry about all these things and we're like, well, that was stupid. Look at all the time and energy I wasted. Look at all the stupid things I did because I was worrying when I should have been praying and trusting the Lord and moving on and focusing on. How many times do we skip church or skip reading our Bible or skip prayer because we choose to fill our time with worry and anxiety as if we can do anything about it by doing those things? When all we do is wear ourselves down more. When we can build ourselves up in Christ in prayer. Notice especially verse 32. Your heavenly Father knows what you need already. That's why Paul says, make it known to the Lord. He knows already. Make it known to the Lord. So he makes known to you as you pray, you remember these things. Look back to verses 8 to 15, though. Chapter 6 of Matthew be beginning with verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. There it is again. But he's telling you to pray. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now look at verses 14 to 15. For if ye forgive men, excuse me, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And I want you to be remembering verse 12 of the prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Beloved, notice the emphasis. He closes the Lord's prayer and he seems to give a lot of attention to and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Notice the emphasis on forgiveness and forgiving. Being forgiven and forgiving others. Notice the emphasis of that in the prayer and its explanation. Because frankly, beloved, I submit to you, most of our anxiety is related to unforgiveness. We are afraid and anxious that God doesn't really forgive us of our sins. Especially not that one, right? Whatever it is. And we're afraid to come and talk to him in prayer. But we come to God in prayer and we pray all the scriptures that talk about the forgiveness we have in Christ. And God assures us in the spirit these things are true. And we have our anxiety for our sins lifted off of us that we keep on us when we worry about what he might do to us. And we relieve one another when we pray and remember to forgive others who have hurt us. We take away the anxiety and the worry and the sadness. We remove it from ourselves when we forgive them in prayer and take it to God. And trust in his providence over it. And wait on him to vindicate us if needs be. And we ask him to let us be forgiven and seek the forgiveness of others I submit to you that may be the greatest cause of most of our anxiety. Our sin and the sin of others and the lack of taking it to God in prayer. But beloved, Jesus is saying, don't worry about your sins. Through Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ, you've forgiven all your sins. You come to God in prayer and have his peace. Remembering you have peace with God through Christ. See, when you come to God in prayer, what is impossible to fully comprehend, but you can appreciate is his power to forgive, his authority to forgive all your sins. So you need not worry about any of them. 
And you are given the power to forgive everyone all their sins so they need not weigh you or them down. Don't take care of anything. Don't worry about anything. Because you are to cast your cares on him before, because he cares for you in everything. Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Which is good, because Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Thinking needs to be focused on, and it will be focused on in the next verses with Paul. And it's so much an idea of Matthew 6, change the way you're thinking. God will establish your thoughts, again, which is good because as you think in your heart, so you are. Are you a worrier, a grumbler, a murmurer? Or are you going to be a person of faith and peace and contentment praying to God? You can come to God in prayer and walk away with his glory and his light shining on your faces and in your eyes. Though you still have to go look at the same problems that you may have to endure for some time. And people don't get it. And you can't even quite explain it, but it's real and supernatural. And you can simply say to yourself and others, God is good, and all the time, God is good. His Bible tells me so. It's way over my head, but my head has peace. Because of Romans 11, 33 to 36, which I turn to also so often to give me peace. Oh, the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Who can look at his judgments? Who can understand his thoughts? They are beyond finding out. Who can be his counselor? Who can give back to him he's given to you? Of him, through him, to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. I just give glory to God. I don't understand. I just give glory to God. He knows what he's doing. I don't pretend to counsel him. I don't pretend to figure him out. But I'll come to hear him in prayer and submit to God in prayer and walk away with God's peace. That he knows what he's doing. Even when I can't understand it all. And it gives resolve that he's made me Although it's so hard to wrap my brain around, instead I can wrap myself up in his presence and his providence through prayer all the time, everywhere. It's the best place to end with worry. It's the best place to start. I'm reminded of a placard on uh, Elder Renner's, uh, something Elder Renner prayed recently in a Wednesday night prayer, and it's kind of something I've picked up, and we talk about it now. Uh, The Renner's daughter Uh, has a placard on her wall that says, but first, pray. That needs needs to be the motto of our life and the practice of our life. Oh, I'm so worried I'm... But first, pray. Let's not talk about the prayer need for 30, 40 minutes. Let's pray about it for 30, 40 minutes. Before we talk about it, and then after. But first, prayer. That's the right focus even before discussing a problem or much problematic people or problems within ourselves. But first, prayer. J. Montgomery Boyce writes this. Prayer is talking with God for believers only. It has to be through Christ. It is the means by which an empty soul that has been touched by Jesus Christ can be thrust beneath the life-giving fountain of God's grace can bask in God's goodness, and can be supernaturally refreshed for life's tasks. When you are anxious, anxious, pray or sing Psalm 73, 21 to 28 that we sang together this evening. One of the go-to things for me in anxiety. And it begins, I was like a beast, and in the middle it remembers, I don't need anyone in heaven or earth but God, who is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In the middle it also says, God will lead me through this life and afterward bring me into glory. And it ends with, it was good for me to draw near to God. 
because it ends with eternity in view, and that puts all other present things in their proper perspective, as much as we can make of it all. But we don't have to worry about anything, and we mustn't, because we can be praying about everything. And in all things, God will give us himself and his shalom, Because it all makes sense to him in its perfect providence presently. And his peace in himself can radiate in us as we take our cares to him and receive his care in prayer. So beloved, don't worry. Be praying. Here's a little sermon I wrote. Don't worry. Be praying. So I asked you to consider, before we started, what are you worrying about right now? Let's take it to prayer. Let's pray. O Lord God in heaven, we confess before you we hold on to so many things deep within us in our weakness, in our sins, in our fear, in our little faith. Lord, we offer up to you right now the things that have us worried, the things we choose to worry and be anxious about, that we that we have care over, that we think too much about. Lord, we offer them up to you. I pray for a moment that each of us would offer up to you right now in prayer what we're worrying about too much even today, certainly this week. We thank you. We can come to you, O Father, and be reminded that you know our needs before we just asked. And remind us that you have it all under control. You're working it all for our good, for your glory, the building of your kingdom. And we'll understand better later. But we can have your peace now because of your all-surpassing knowledge. Help us not to worry but to be praying. Help us to worry about nothing, but to be praying about all things through Jesus Christ who is near in the Spirit and by his blood. And bless us, O Lord, with your peace, almighty, all-knowing, 